I just want to get started so we can have as much time as possible for questions. First of all, I have to thank our hosts. Uh, thank you so much for everyone who organized um, with the long 1960s and also the co-sponsorship from radical anthropologists. Some of my best friends are radical anthropologists. So I appreciate uh, all the mobilization and all of the efforts um, that it took to bring everyone together in this room, including me. So today what I want to talk about is some new research that I'm doing on the movement against the Vietnam War, the U.S. war in Vietnam, amongst African Americans um, from a radical perspective with a focus on people who mobilize um, in various different ways against uh, U.S. foreign policy actions and how they together ant articulated an anti-imperialist framework. Okay, So I'm going to read my paper and um, just so I can stay timely and I'll be happy to have questions at the, um, at the end. So my goal here is to center the long history um, of black radical anti-imperialism and anti-colonialism. Um, in particular, I'm interested in how grassroots African Americans, especially women, saw themselves in the world in the era of the long 1960s. Uh, the analytical frameworks that they used, the language they employed to make their protests visible, uh, legible. Sometimes they use the language of the hard left politics and sometimes the language of the blues. I'm interested in how they circulated ideas, how they contributed to global intellectual cross currents, and how they organized in pursuit of what they call global justice. So today I'm going to share the story of four people, um, Charles Cobb, civil rights activist, Patricia Murphy Robinson, radical theorist, Gwen Patton, feminist anti-draft activist, and J.B. Lenore, blues singer. And through the storytelling around their lives and their activism, I hope to put on the table some of the various strategies that radical African Americans use to articulate dissent from U.S. foreign policy actions in the 1960s, in particular the U.S. war in Vietnam. Their stories collectively point to deep cross currents of black anti-war sentiment and a multiplicity of ways of engaging with anti-war work from the organizational to the cultural um, to the educational. So I want to start with some images <laughs> um, because I think it's so important to kind of get a alternative visual of what African American organizing against the U.S. war in Vietnam looked like. Uh, Martin Luther King is so often utilized to represent the black anti-war political tradition. This paper centers on the activism that predated and postscripted his April 4th, 1967 speech, Time to Break the Silence. And it articulates uh, the argument that protests in black America around the U.S. war in Vietnam was bigger, deeper, and wider than any one individual. Black anti-war activism was part of a long tradition of black radical anti-imperialist politics that stretched back to the 1920s and increasingly took center stage during the global upheavals of the 50s and 60s. Spurred by the military draft, black grassroots activists created vibrant anti-war organizations that would become an integral part of the black freedom movement. So this paper is centered around uh, three arguments. So the four, four lives sort into three um, arguments. So point one, and let me shift on to Dr. King and his very well-known um, Beyond Vietnam, Time to Break the Silent Speech in 1967, which is really heralded as, for many, the beginning of black engagement with uh, the politics of the U.S. war in Vietnam. So I'm arguing that it actually came at the end point, or many people had done many things before that and of course these are some of of those people right so the first argument black anti-war activism was part of a larger global context resisting Vietnam moved black activists in the US into the world to make alliances to attend international conferences and to network with third world revolutionaries and European allies um, examining black radicals transnational activism around Vietnam broadens the conception of the black freedom movement. So introducing Charles Cobb. 
1967, Charles Cobb observed that the war seems and is very close. He was talking about Mississippi, not Vietnam. Five years earlier, he left Howard University in Washington, D.C., where he was a student activist, and he headed to a civil rights workshop in Texas. Serendipitously, he ended up in Jackson, Mississippi, an area deep in the throes of massive resistance to the civil rights movement. He was told upon arrival in Mississippi, you are in the war zone here. Because of this and despite this, he stayed. And he joined the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, a leading grassroots civil rights organization in the US. After five years that was filled with perilous on the ground organizing in Mississippi, in some of the, rurest, uh, the poorest rural communities in the nation, Cobb and another <coughs> SNCC activist, Julius Lester, ended up in Phnom Penh, Cambodia, en route to Vietnam. In Lester's words, it was the organization's, quote, first big move into the international arena, end quote. Well, the scholarship has not followed activists like Lester and Cobb into this arena when it comes to the U.S. war in Vietnam. In fact, the way that scholars write about social protest in this period, um, it has analyzed the anti-war movement as if it unfolded almost exclusively within U.S. borders. Um, this is not an anomaly for a historiography that also analyzes the war as if it was, um, that doesn't acknowledge the long wars uh, that the Vietnamese were struggling and fighting um, for many years for their independence. So scholars of U.S. foreign relations and U.S. in the world have increasingly placed Vietnam in an international context, noting that because of the end of the Cold War, new sources are available um, for scholars based in the U.S. that have, have allowed uh, them to look at the war as an episode in world history, not just an episode as part of U.S. history, told only through American sources. So the shift towards casting the U.S. war in Vietnam in international context has profound study for the implications, rather, for the study of the anti-war movement. Protesting the war connected black activists to revolutionary movements and organizations around the world. And travel, just like Charles Cobb and Julius Lester did, was a key part of that transnational activism. I'm just going to skip that part. I'm already thinking about time. I'm going to make sure to get to all uh, four lives. So, but going abroad amplified the pressures that these activists were able to put on the U.S. government from inside and outside of the U.S. and reflected also the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, the DRV's diplomatic efforts to win allies. Cobb and Lester's trip reflects the confluence of anti-war mobilization in Europe, um, the DRV's war crime commission engagement in people's democracy, and the black freedom movement's evolving anti-colonial worldview. Cobb and Lester's trip was funded by Bertrand Russell, one of the conveners of the International War Crimes Tribunal. Cobb described their mission as, quote, traveling, looking at the effects of the war, investigating U.S. war crimes. Cobb and Lester also planned to dialogue intensively about how the struggles that the Vietnamese were facing were similar to the struggles that they were facing as members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee doing grassroots work in Mississippi. In August 1966, the New York Times had reported that North Vietnam applauded the civil rights movement for opening the second front against American imperialism. The implication was that the civil rights movement um, was connected to resisting uh, the Vietnam War, the U.S. War in Vietnam, and uh, applauded by Hanoi. White House officials had uh, from the State Department, the Defense Department, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the U.S. Information Agency had launched a campaign overseas to discredit Bertrand Russell's Peace Foundation and even tried to persuade several third world um, leaders to withdraw their support for the tribunal. U.S. officials even mulled a project to organize a, quote, counter seminar in Europe to blunt the war crimes tribunal. Cobb felt a particular connection to the Vietnamese quest for independence because of his experience of violence, racism, and exclusion in the U.S. He also felt connected to the land. His first stop had been the Mekong Delta, the area created by the Mekong River 
in Cambodia and southern Vietnam. Cobb noted, quote, it looks like the Mississippi Delta. It really does, only wetter. The Mississippi Delta, located between the Mississippi River and the Yazoo River, was home to King Cotton during the era of slavery, the birthplace of the blues, and had been called the most southern place on earth. Although he'd never had a passport before this trip, his soul told him that he'd been there before. Quote, quoting him, he says, I knew I had traveled the roads and paths and fields I saw. The houses, of course, were differently styled, but sharecropper shacks in the Mekong Delta. Cobb would later write a poem whose title merged the Mekong into the Mississippi, title Mekong Sippy, number one. The poem described the watermarked landscapes in both locations and juxtaposed the political histories of Vietnam and black America from Amsterdam Avenue in Harlem, New York to the Delta. He traced what scholar James Jajang has called the moral geography of American oppression. Yeah. The Mississippi runs into the Mekong, get the boat at Harlem, sail Red Rivers, Black Seas, or walk from cotton to rice, from cement to silt, Vietnam and Amsterdam, avenues of Whitey's Wars, Mekong Sippy, the 17th isn't parallel, doesn't divide. Travel taught Cobb and Lester lessons in neocolonialism. They found America in the world in the realities of corporate capital and cultural imperialism. Lester noted, quote, the movie theater showing Davy Crockett and Elvis Presley, the cigarette stand selling Philip Morris, Marlboros, etc., the come alive you're in the Pepsi generation calendars, and the Coke signs and the Avenue Charles de Gaulle. They also found America in that most unexpected place inside themselves. Understanding that their relative wealth and privilege meant that they were being received with, quote, both deference and hate. This feeling of being an American was foreign and unwelcome. Cobb pointedly used quotations around the word American in his letters home, uh, noting the ugliness of being American was driven home during the trip. Later in a poem called to Vietnam, he attested to the ways that racism shapes his experiences of nationhood, proclaiming that wind has never sung song of nation in my black face. The trip concretized the underground realities in Vietnam and added texture to the Vietnam that African-American activists constructed and projected as they mobilized against the war. They noted that the language barriers, the media images, the cultural differences, the way that their Afros caused, um, became a spectacle, that those things made them feel othered in that space. They definitely understood that their trip was heavily curated and the Vietnamese activists that they met had their own goals for the interaction. They were not passive recipients of solidarity. Um, Cobb and Lester navigated cautiously, steadfastly refusing to be pawns from their European sponsors, um, where they talked about being on guard against being used, um, and also on guard um, and all the situation that they found themselves in. Yet they built political bridges and they continually underscored shared histories of struggle that made them feel at home despite it all. Cobb persistently noted in his letters um, his creation of almost a glossary of terms and translations for what he was seeing. So he said, for example, that imperious landowner was the rough equivalent of plantation owner. And he fought liter literally and figuratively um, for a common language. The second point, Anti-Vietnam War activism was part of a long history of black anti-imperialism that can be traced back to the 1950s, and black feminists played a pivotal role in this movement. So this is introducing Patricia Murphy Robinson and um, Gwen Patton. So in 1968, a collective of women who defined themselves as poor black women of Mount Vernon penned an open letter to North Vietnamese guerrilla fighters um, against U.S. troops in the Vietnam War. The letter provided an overview of black history. Um, it decried everyone from the black middle class to um, white ra racism to patriarchal black men as the sources of black women's oppression. 
They talked about speaking from the belly of the monster and professed a unity with all oppressed throughout the world. Boldly stating, quote, we have come to join them in the struggle for a new world and a new people. This letter was written by members of Black Women in Rage, a collective uh, spearheaded by working class women in New Rochelle, New York, in the wake of Malcolm X's assassination. These women sought to challenge poverty, sexism, and racism at home, and they sought common cause with activists in the third world engaged in similar struggles for self-determination. Like Cobb and Lester, these women made alliances, they traveled internationally, and they networked with Vietnamese political actors. In addition to dealing with the state's response to their activism, they dealt with the impact of their political work on their family life and the gendered expectations around their political activism. So the recovery of their history sheds light on how black feminists worked against colonialism and imperialism as part of their multi-issue approach to transformative uh, politics. Patricia Murphy Robinson was one of the key people involved in Black Women in Rage. Um, her history demonstrates the central role that women played in the movement against the Vietnam War as activists, theorists, writers, and polemicists. Robinson was radicalized during the McCarthy era. Um, she was married shortly after graduating from Simmons College in 1948, and she grew up as part of the black elite. Accused Soviet spies Juliet and Ethel Rosenberg were executed one month after she had her first child in 1953. Robinson believed deeply that the Rosenbergs were innocent, but victims of, of, of McCarthy's scapegoating. Uh, she stifled her opinion not only because of the political risk to her in the outer world, but the political risk to her in her home life. She said um, she made a complicated calculus that many women made about their politics in 1959. She said, uh, quote, I had to dialogue with myself. Should I do this? Meaning speak out. Will it harm the kids? At this point, she's the mother of three. How much was it worth to upset Lloyd, her husband, and his family? What do I have to gain? So instead of having big confrontations about the Rosenbergs, I kept it all in and I had this tremendous depression. I lost a lot of weight, I got thin. And I thought, I can't be doing this. I gotta take care of these kids. So it was not easy because there was no one you could talk to. Robinson was able to find radical spaces and networks and circuits that existed in the 1950s despite the political repression associated with the Cold War um, and McCarthyism and anti-communism. She refused to join the Communist Party due to its racism, but she developed a political practice that was rooted in anti-sexist and anti-racist ideas and operated in largely black working class community. Rather than joining a sectarian organization, she turned to studying and reading leftist literature. She says, I started reading Monthly Review in 1949. Uh, she says it kept her straight up because it was clear and it wasn't affixed to any party. All these people were thinking and they were able to analyze the economic system. The pages of Monthly Review were filled with critical perspectives about the Korean War, the Bandung Conference, um, the Mau Mau Rebellion, the Algerian War, the Cuban Revolution, and African decolonization. She would become a voracious reader, creating a vast personal library of hundreds of books that range from theoretical texts to pamphlets from the front lines of movements unfolding in Africa, Latin America, and Asia. Through her library, she spoke back to everyone from Marx to Freud to CLR James to feminist thinkers. Through the various markings that she made in the text, the passages that she highlighted, um, the ways that she scribbled definitions of words, um, etc. The Cuban Revolution was a turning point for her, and after that, she started to speak out and organize publicly. She says, at the end of 1959, that's when my mouth started opening. I didn't care about shit. I'm gonna say what I believe. She went to Cuba in 1963 in a very transformative trip, and she began to polemicize actively and openly, uh, including at her kitchen table. Um, Robin Robinson, her eldest child, was inspired uh, by her mom's uh, activism, her library, and her work to create a poster celebrating Cuba for her fifth grade class project. Um, but she was victim of anti-communist um, vitriol on the part of her teacher. 
she was just 10 years old. It, it was yet another occasion where Robinson went up to the school to fight for her daughter's right of political self-expression. These quotidian moments were the building blocks of consciousness and sites of activism that indicated black women's expanding global consciousness. So that is the Cuba poster that the 10 year old created that created all of the controversy. <laughs> In 1971, Robinson organized two carloads of poor black women, some of whom were her clients, and including her then teenage daughter, Robin, to travel to Canada to meet with Vietnamese women at the Indo-Chinese Women's Conference. Driving as a mode of travel allowed the group to, to share costs and include women without a lot of resources. Uh, the image of strong women fighters uh, resonated with black radicals at its heightened time of debate around gender equality. The, uh, all of the books and pamphlets and journals that Robinson had had, um, had in her library and was influenced by was, were published as part of the DRV's efforts to shape world opinion and they were disseminated in underground networks uh, by black radical bookstores like Harlem's Liberation Books. Um, these meetings, and especially meeting Vietnamese women, uh, was key to Robinson's efforts to work at the nexus of feminism and anti-imperialist activism. Her story reveals the way that black women articulate their resistance to war in terms that explicitly engage gender and the constraints that they face, not only from the larger political climate, but because of their gender. These women developed a transnational feminist framework to understanding social issues and communities. Um, and gender was a bridge that connected them to women around the world. Now, Gwen Patton is another person that I want to introduce um, under this uh, framework. You might be able to recognize Dr. King in this very well-known photo from Selma, Alabama in 1965, but Gwen Patton too um, was there. So Gwen Patton um, issued a memo in 1968 um, calling uh, for women to come together um, if, if they were interested in starting a black women's liberation committee. She circulated it amongst women in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee with the goal of creating this nationwide network of women. In a later memo, she defined gender relations as being, quote, at rock bottom and saying it was time to begin to analyze why it was difficult for black men and women to have real communication. And even though many would like to say it's an ego problem, we must begin to analyze the nature of the American system. These memos are part of the origin story of what would become the SNCC Black Women's Liberation Committee. Patton was a student activist based out of Tuskegee University in Alabama. Um, after the brutal murder of student activist, veteran and friend Sammy Young in 1966, she increasingly centralized anti-war activism that rooted itself both in women's rights and anti-racist politics. She felt an urgency to speak out against the drafting of black men. In the face of the Moynihan reports about the detrimental effect of powerful black women and the increasing currency of a misogynistic strain of black nationalism, Patton's early speeches framed draft resistance um, in patriarchal terms, positing it as a positive good uh, that got denied to black family due to racism. Some of her earlier letters say things like, the time has come for black women to come to the aid of their black men. We cannot allow this racist society to draw our men to fight a war against the people who are in the same plight that we find ourselves in. The new instrument is to draft as many black men as possible to fight in a racist and atrocious war. Black women was moved to stop this. Let us return to our true heritage of having men the head of his home. The ferment of the times and the potential of black power a vehicle, as a vehicle for social change, Patton's thoughts refined. And I think I like to focus on her because it's important to think about how women's ideals about gender shifted and changed over time. She shifted towards um, a more internationalist perspective and she said if we look closely at revolutionary struggles in France, Albania, Cuba, Vietnam, you will find that the more intense the struggle, the more liberated the women are. And the more victorious they become, it becomes a nature of love and a nation of brotherhood. Patton was not alone. 
SNCC member uh, Fran Beal would also play a role in providing the intellectual foundations for the Black Women's Liberation Committee. They took the metaphor of war and they deployed it to bring urgency around debates around sexism. If black revolution was one war to be fought and mobilizing against Vietnam was another war, then misogyny was also part of this war at home. And home was not just the nation, but the household. Beale noted that, quote, I think that brothers have got to begin to understand that a revolution entails not only the willingness to go out there and lay your life on the line and get killed. To me, that's almost an easy kind of commitment to make. The difficult commitment is the change that you make in your day-to-day -day life, your routine life, the way you deal with each other, how you deal with your wife, your girlfriend, your family, your children. Patton hoped to use the Black Women's Liberation Committee to raise awareness about Vietnam as related to imperialism and racism internationally. She focused on educating black people around the Vietnam War and, quote, raising the whole question of international affairs in the black community. She said, black people have now been questioning the role of apartheid in South Africa, and I think it's good that the Vietnam War has raised that issue. Black women were uniquely um, qualified to take on, take the lead on this question. She said that in South Africa for 20 years, young brothers fought, were forced to fight in the army, kind of a genocide fighting other people who are struggling for the same things we are. And we feel the trend is soon to come about a professional army. And we feel we can get into a real discussion about that. They're gonna send people over to Africa and have black people annihilate other black people in Niger and the Congo, in Nigeria and the Congo, I should say. And she asked, um, quote, is the black woman willing to get her capitalist freedom by annihilating our brothers and sister in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, in all oppressed countries, or just some? <coughs> These women would eventually found the National Black Anti-War Anti-Draft Union and contribute to black organizing against conscription. So my final point in my fourth person, um, I want to argue that the role of black cultural workers in the anti-Vietnam War movement was central. Artists used their sketch pads, their song lyrics, and their poetry to raise awareness. And I, I'm sorry, I think I should have uh, advanced there. So um, artists used their sketch pads, their song lyrics, and their poetry to raise consciousness around U.S. involvement in Vietnam and articulate anti-imperialist views. So I wanted to talk a little bit about J.B. Lenore, a, sh a Chicago bluesman with a distinct high-pitched pitched voice and deep southern roots in Monticello, Mississippi. His lyrics speak into existence the same connections between the black experience and Vietnam War that led uh, Charles Cobb to coin the term Mekong Sippy. Black music unfolded in a transnational context as black culture became a key state manufactured import of the Cold War, while the growing black freedom movement came to be a global system of resistance. The blues represent this juncture, overlooked by a musical protest tradition that focuses on either Southern freedom songs or anti-war white folk music. From Pete Seeger to Bob Dylan, it is clear that music was a key means of expression used to stoke anti-war consciousness in the black community. During his decade and a half, his decade and a half music career, J.B. Lenore would write songs about Eisenhower blues, the Alabama blues, and two different songs called Vietnam blues. At a time where scholars of the blues acknowledged that it was losing its social commentary, he used the same lyrics um, consistently to create uniquely political um, lyrics. While repetition is the hallmark of the blues, the recurrence of these central and critical political themes also suggests that Lenore was making a connection between oppression across time and space. It's important to note that the first two lines of Vietnam blues were exactly the first two lines of Korea blues, an anti-war song that he'd written earlier. Vietnam blues was re recorded in 1965 as one of the first um, anti-war uh, war song, anti-war songs. Recorded in 1965, the second version of Vietnam Blues took a more pointedly political tone, and I'll play that um, at the end. 
But the lyrics, um, Vietnam, Vietnam, everyone's crying about Vietnam. The laws all day killing me down in Mississippi. Nobody seems to give a damn. Um, and he goes on. Uh, Mr. President, you always cry about peace, but you must clean up your house before you leave. Oh, how you cry about peace, but you clean up your house before you leave. How can you tell the world we need peace and you're still mistreating and killing poor old me? When Lenore was not able to find an audience for his more political work in the U.S., he was able to leverage uh, transnational political circuits. His connections to producer and singer Willie Dixon um, resulted in enough visibility for him to be invited abroad. He joined other Chicago blues music singers for the American Folk Music Festival organized by well-known German producers Horst Lippmann and Fritz Rau in Europe in 1965 and 66. The festival toured Germany, France, Switzerland, Denmark, Sweden, Belgium, and Holland. <coughs> During this time, he recorded songs like Shot on James Meredith, Alabama March, and Born Dead. European audiences hungered to bear witness to accounts of white racism in the United States that they had seen on television. And folk blues were described by the press in the United Kingdom as, quote, having their roots in the bitter soil of racial inequality. In 1969, an article in The Guardian talked about the popularity of blues music amongst uh, Europeans. Quote, it could seem odd, even a shame, that Lancaster, Lancaster teens choose the natural music not of a different race, but of a different era to develop their own analyses. But the connection is not so stretched. Participation in this popular festival meant that his music had a wide influence um, as well. Uh, even though he would return to a life of obscurity and die in poverty, um, the legacy of his songs and his music and the influence that his music had on key um, musicians who would then become the front line of this more folk music, uh, blues influenced folk music uh, later in the 60s is very important. So people like the Rolling Stones, um, the Beatles, um, John Mayow um, as well. So I wanted to end with uh, just playing uh, some of his Vietnam blues and then opening up the floor for questions. Clean up the 
going to pause there um, so thank you <laughs> so hopefully that was a great diversity of food for thought and I look forward to questions Or thoughts or comments it doesn't have to be a question. Yeah. I have a question. Mm -hmm. And I see several hands, so maybe I'll just count them out. So one, was there another hand? Two? Anyone else for now? Okay, we'll start with those two. Yes. Um, can you tell us the meaning of the term radical in the late nineteen sixties? Mm -hmm. And what's the difference between radical and black radical? Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that um, what I'm, when I'm saying uh, black radical, for me, those were people who literally wanted to get to the root of oppression. So they focused on structural inequality. So especially focused on the economic system and transforming that as a foundation of building a new type of society. Um, for, for my radicals as well, even though not all of them, they also aspire to trans, tr transform the relations of inequality um, between peoples like men and women uh, within the household, um, people who were queer or non-gender conforming. So they also took radicalism to mean that's, that spectrum and level of protest um, as well. Now, I think that for black radicals, they saw uh, the war in Vietnam as an, as an area of action because they felt that it very much uh, reflected the oppressions that they saw in their daily lives, even sometimes in their home life, as well as what they saw, uh, criticizing what they saw as US actions in, in the world. There were other types of radicals during this time period as well, but not all radicals, for example, were as anti-racist, as um, anti-sexist as well. So even though they may have called themselves that, the criteria for what they did did not um, fit that. So for my purposes, I'm interested in people who were critical of the U.S. state, who posed a critical, had a critical stance towards capitalism, um, who also questioned um, sexism and misogyny and different ways of viewing, viewing the world. I see a lot of potential in kind of excavating those, those kinds of stories. But was it difficult for people to be explicitly Marxist? <laughs> Not cover mm -hmm. Marxism or what's what's that relationship? Well, I think that some of the people that I'm looking at were, for example, members of organizations that were organizing um, alternatives to capitalism, right? So some of the people that I look at, maybe that I didn't mention here, but people who were involved in the Black Panther Party, people who were involved in, in other types of organizations, they saw themselves as Marxists. Certainly Patricia Murphy Robinson saw herself um, as a Marxist. She read Marx, she understood Marx, she used Marx as a short can in her um, analyses in her educational efforts. Now all of the radicals did not consider themselves um, to be Marxist, right? So they were people who considered themselves to be revolutionary nationalists who were critical, who had a both race and class critique um, as well. So it's kind of a broad spectrum, I think. This was a time period, I think, where the idea of radicalism was um, deeply contested and being refined. Uh, by people as they went through the process of struggle, I would say. Mm -hmm. okay, I, saw a hand I think there was two, and then we'll go. Yes. Ah, uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I do so much. I mean, I grew up in New York. I grew up not far from where the children of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg mm -hmm. lived after their parents were executed with Mirabeau, who mm -hmm. wrote the song Strange Fruit. Mm -hmm. right? And I was in the Peace and Freedom Party and we formed a coalition with the Black Panther Party to get Eldridge Cleaver on the ballot. 
I don't know exactly what my questions are, uh, because there's so much that isn't said in this. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, about um, efforts to um, provide legal aid to people who wanted to avoid the draft, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And I mean, there's this huge movement, to, as you say, encompassing so many things. And, and I'm, I just, I just don't see this relating to that, that the richness of all of that somehow. I just, mm -hmm. I really don't know what, what to, what to ask. Um, this seems so small, mm -hmm. you know, and there was a, you said, I mean, even, um, I know that you don't want to talk about famous people, but Muhammad Ali, mm -hmm. and his, you know, no Viet Cong ever called me nigger, mm -hmm. you know, that, that helped to propel a huge amount of, um, you know, activism against, against the war. And then there were the contradictions. I mean, there were lots of people, black activists and others who sort of became quite reactionary ultimately, mm -hmm. tragically, like Bayard Wright Lustin, who were worried about the, um, the, the anti-Vietnam, and also in relation to Martin Luther King, um, you know, working against, you know, the, the struggle for justice and civil rights in, in the United States, because it would, would draw the focus away from that. I'm sure you must be, mm -hmm. be aware of all, all of that. And at the same time, there are all sorts of things, you know, like the, when the draft began to be at Vietnam, the uh, African Americans were essentially cannon fodder. You know, they were used as cannon fodder in, in, in Vietnam. But at the same time, it, there's the irony of that f to a lot of people, um, the uh, being a soldier allowed b black people then to have, uh, oddly, you know, more rights of advancement in the army at, at certain times than in, in any other, every other part of, of, of civil life. Um, and, um, well, you know what I'll say? I'm deeply convinced that it's really important to tell the stories of people, individual people, less well-known people. The telling and retelling of the Muhammad Ali story and the Dr. King story, um, male leaders who participate in these large, wide-scale actions, doesn't, how does that help movement building today, I ask? Movement building today is based on individuals taking action, educating themselves, speaking to other people, and sort of becoming part of a collective. And I think for me, it's important to focus on these people's stories because they help us to understand when Dr. King gave anti-war speeches, why those people were there, right? How did they educate themselves? Um, what restrained them? Yeah, we want to know that you know the FBI constrained them, but sometimes it was your partner and your children <laughs> and the work that you had to do in the household that also constrained you. That is also, I think, part of the story and a very important part of the story. Yeah, I so I feel like when we think about even, you know, how movements work and how they operate, it's important to look at them on all different, um, at all different levels of scale we could say, right? So some of the people that I talk about become parts of larger movements. Like for example, I say that there's an organization called the National Black Anti-War Anti-Draft Union, which becomes part of a whole black draft counselor movement, which becomes part of a whole movement of um, challenging the war on that level at induction centers and other parts um, of, the, of, of the military machine. But then I think it's also important to note that, um, that books people read People educated themselves, they subscribed to magazines, because when we think about why aren't movements building today, we have to say, well, those bookstores are gone, those journals are gone, the newspapers are gone, the circuits that brought the front lines of the Vietnam War to people living in Wellesley, Massachusetts <laughs> are gone. We, even though we have sort of the information superhighway and, and all of that, right? But somehow we have fewer, we have fewer of those circuits and networks. So that's what I'm interested in. I mean, that's sort of my perspective on the U.S. war in Vietnam and the role of, of black radicals. There are lots of books already on Dr. King and um, Muhammad Ali, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. you know, I just think that there was a vast 
movement. I'm not really being critical. It just uh, it just evokes a lot of memories of so many things going on, you know. And it's hard. I think it's hard to really, that's why I decided on the storytelling in the visual life. It's hard to tell such a complex story, right? Because so many things are happening. People are involved in so many things at once, right? So it's not just Vietnam. It's also the Dominican Republic invasion. It's also about, um, you know, the Portuguese colonies uh, getting their independence in Africa. It's also about, you know, what's happening and the role of the State Department and the, the you know, sort of what's happening in the government level. It's about a lot of things. But I feel like if you can tell people's stories and how those people dealt with and moved through those moments of history, that you can kind of open it up in different ways. I mean, you won't cover everything. Yeah. Thank you for your comment. I've seen mm -hmm. another hand here. Could I make um, just three quick points? Mm -hmm. um, I'd be interested in hearing a slightly wider approach to mm -hmm. the individual stories. And I know mm -hmm. you've got limited time and space, so I'm not complaining about this. But if you look at somebody like Bayard Rustin. Mm -hmm. I worked for him, by the way. She worked for him. She worked for him. She said she worked for him, by the way. Well, he was in the Communist <laughs> Youth League in the 19, or close to it, in the mm -hmm. 1930s. Now, if he was profoundly influenced by it, on all the evidences that he was, mm -hmm. there must have been a very widespread influence on black youth by that organization in the 1930s, mm -hmm. long before, I think, the period you're mm -hmm. talking about. Secondly, if you look at um, the history of Rosa Parks, she was trained in, at the Highlander School in techniques of civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. yeah. And politically, that had, although small, did have a profound impression. Mm -hmm. yeah, the third point I want to ask about is, there was a strong organization called Vietnam Veterans Against the War. What proportion of those were African Americans? And did African Americans particularly organize against the war? Now I recently reread a book called The War Within by somebody called, I think, John or Charles Wells mm -hmm. about the war within the United States. And one of the things that comes across very strongly is how difficult it was to get an anti-imperialist message out of the resistance to the Vietnam War. It will damage the case against the war if we're too openly anti-imperialist. Now that's quite an interesting position to take, mm -hmm. and I wonder if that comes across at all in the movements, the uh, development of the movements that you've described. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I think that um Thank you for the question and the comments and very interesting <laughs> connection that you made there. Um, definitely there's a long history. So for example, one of the people that I'm going to look at um, is Sarah Wright. She is a poet who becomes part of Poets Against the War. She is involved in um, the Communist Party. She goes to Communist Party summer camps in New York in the 1950s and the Catskills. I think a lot of the story and why I start in the 1950s is because the people who were involved in anti-war activism, a significant portion of them were politicized through their involvement and awareness of uh, you know, anti-Korean war activism, of the Mau Mau rebellion in Kenya, of um, the Bandung conference and seeing themselves and the world through that framework, right? So I'm looking at the development of consciousness and how consciousness becomes part of action. So for example, uh, Sarah Wright becomes connected to William um, Patterson who had the We Charge Genocide, um, who looked at the ways that, <coughs> sorry, of, of the ways that, Af Af <coughs> sorry. Water. water would be nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so thinking through the ways that um, the generational activism was passed down, right? I asked what's new about the new left, right? And what, how did leftist um, 
seeds survive the Cold War, right? In New York in the early 1960s, Malcolm X is one of the people that I'll be looking at. So you have Malcolm X attending social workers, so socialist workers party meetings. You have the upsurgence uh, with many groups like the Progressive Labor Party, like um, the W.B. Du Bois Club. I mean, this is a time where the left is really proliferating and they see the black struggle as the frontier for them to conquer. And on the one hand, there's the external strategy, but then there's also the internal strategy of people who came to their own conclusions and grasped um, Marxist analyses for themselves. And sometimes, like Patricia Murphy Robinson, who didn't want to join the Communist Party because she considered it to be racist, right? That sometimes those paths did not always lead them through those organizations. Sometimes people created their own organizations that were also um, socialist left um, organizations or feminist organizations that were anti-imperialist but didn't see themselves as connected to that particular genealogy but they held on to their own genealogy which may pass you know sort of thread back to places like Highlander Folk School the older labor movement um, but also could be generated by their actions and their activities in organizations in the early 1960s as well so there's definitely kind of a longer um, genealogy uh, for sure <coughs> There, I mean, peace activists were many. And you see this in, you know, analyses of foreign policy today. There's the people who are very involved and interested in one conflict, and they may see it as an aberration, or that's, you know, we've, we've lost our mission, or this doesn't reflect the U.S. values. And then there are people that understand that, you know, the bombings and the killings are exactly U.S. values. And there's a long lineage of those exact same sort of things. So I'm interested in working um, on an ex sort of elaborating on the history of the people who were able to articulate this anti-imperialist consciousness, who didn't just demand peace, right? There was certainly a strong peace movement at this time, a U.S. out of Vietnam movement. But the activists that I'm interested in also talked about um, this, the global nature of injustice. And I think that the travel that they did, the relationships that they built, the analyses that they developed with activists from other parts of the world also undergoing revolutions at the time really shaped their ability to understand that there would be another Vietnam after Vietnam, right? So they certainly continued on um, struggling against like the US actions in Latin America in the 1980s, for example. Like Patricia Murphy Robinson, I can trace her out and she's involved in um, you know, criticizing all of US foreign policy um, from the Middle East to, to, and so on and so on. So, I mean, that's what I would say. Certainly there was a peace movement. It was quite mainstream. There were black faces in there. Um, as well, but I'm interested in people who were able to articulate this um, transformative analysis. I'm interested in their intellectual genealogy. I'm interested in what happened to them. Uh, what were the barriers that they faced, whether it be from the CIA or um, from the people in their lives, and what roots were they able to put down? Because this project really started with me noticing kind of a, not an absence of an anti-war movement amongst black people, but a silence around a very vibrant movement that I could see everywhere, but that seemed to be invisible. Um, we shouldn't have to, when we look up anti-war activism, see images of white protesters marching um, and doing other things, right? It should be broader than that. Um, and thinking about, well, where, where were the black people, right? And what were they doing? I think that's part of it. Vietnam Veterans Against the War. Um, I have not done a lot of research um, in them as yet. I do know that black military, so, uh, black soldiers played a key role in the role of black power. Um, in, in the military, uh, whether it be the uh, newsletters that were created and circulated, whether it be the soldiers who resisted the draft and who became part of, uh, almost seen as part of a new wave of political prisoners um, in their time period, that all of that played, played a role. So one of the people that I'm looking at was somebody, uh, Walter Collins, who was a big, uh, whose case refusing to draft became a sort of a clause celebre 
um, in the U.S. and also globally. Well, Other questions or three more questions? Sure. Questions. One, two, then three. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. As you know, I heard it at Brighton, but I had to come again because I found there's so much richness that I wanted to hear it again. Thank you. Um, I particularly appreciate the fact that you're bringing into our preview a new layer and nuance and new aspects of something that is often talked about, and this is an aspect that's not as mainstream, that hasn't been written about so much. Um, I do appreciate the fact that it's also allowing us to think about the black radical tradition in a you know, more rich way, a more complicated way, vis-a-vis -vis the question of anti-imperialism. And I also do like the de-whitening of it, the peace movement. I'm very mm -hmm. tired of seeing that narrative. So mm -hmm. I see that very strongly as an intervention that mm -hmm. is going to help me think about certain aspects of my work. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely, the truth is I have too many questions. <laughs> And I don't know how many I can I'm put up to you, but some of my questions come out of the fact that your work is helping to think about really practical issues coming up in organizing today. So for example, I'd really like to know a little bit more about the challenges COPs face negotiating the, Euro the agenda of his European uh -huh. facilitators and what was his own preoccupations coming out of the front lines in Mississippi against white supremacy <coughs> violence. I'd really appreciate Anything more you can tell us about Patricia Collins' thinking about racism and the communism intersection and how she tried to negotiate that as a Marxist and how that affected her visioning of what's possible or what to, how to articulate something different. And I'd really love to hear more about how the, the Cuban, Dominican peace was really, how did that get influential, especially when we think about um, how to say the, the the similarities but also differences in the experiences of African people in different sites. Mm -hmm. um, that would be really interesting to know. I'm gonna stop. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe later I can. Yes, yes, we'll stay in touch for sure. Okay. Um, thank you for those questions and um, comments. I have found that almost everyone that I'm interested in um, was very interested in Cuba, that the Cuban Revolution was a, a turning point for them. It was something that was valorized. It was a place that they all found a way to get to using various networks um, that were available at the time or going on delegations and things like that. I'm also very aware that uh, the presence of Robert Williams in Cuba at this time, who was an African-American radical, um, was kind of was a beacon for black radicals that it was okay on the ground. Now, ironically, Robert Williams, who's another person that I'm, I'm dealing with um, in the book, he leaves Cuba citing racism and um, the ability to do the kind of political work he wanted to do freely. So I think there's definitely, as part of this travel, that the radicals are very much seeing, sort of they're going from a faraway view of these revolutionary places that they valorize to a close-up view of those places. And that's very radicalizing. Um, for them, right? To go to Cuba and experience racism, to go to Cuba and see the different hierarchies uh, that go along with um, color and class, the presence of class still um, within Cuban society, those sorts of questions. People wrote about those experiences, but in the context of the comparative to the United States, right? They saw Cuba as a society in the making, right? They, they hoped that these were issues that could be resolved um, in this sort of exciting moment when it felt like things could change in a revolutionary way and that the government was the harbinger of that change um, in very um, 
sort of farce, farsighted ways. So that that is the reality. So Patricia Murphy Robinson goes to Cuba and, and again on a very kind of curated trip and she comes away with that understanding. When, when um, she goes to meet the Vietnamese women in Canada, for example, she realizes that her radical feminism, which is talking about the family and gender relations and sexuality and sexual freedom, that those Vietnamese women freedom fighters are not radical on that level, right? They're not interested, they are fighting for national liberation. They are not thinking in the same ways, using that same language um, about the family and, and all of that. So these were again sort of radicalizing um, transnational meeting places. So I'm really interested in thinking about what was the impact of that kind of travel? How did it shift and change how um, these activists thought about uh, what revolution would look like, what it would entail um, as well? So I'm really interested in kind of making that that kind of connection. So yes, there were definitely challenges of bridge building. Um, Charles Cobb uh, talks about trying to assert their own agenda while also shuffling along to the lectures that sometimes they were an audience of two to lectures about the Vietnamese situation or Vietnamese history and things like that. They understood that they were being given a uh, a version, right? But they still felt that that version had the potential to be liberatory. Um, and they felt that they had enough interface with ordinary people where they could, and also interface with what they could see, right? That they could see um, this commitment to struggle. They could see this uh, connection with other revolutionaries around around the world. So when the Panthers are in Algeria, they're meeting with uh, the people who are involved in Palestinian liberation, who are involved in the Vietnamese struggle as well. And so they're seeing this as kind of a world in transformation. And that's what I really want to bring out because I feel like we don't see that world in transformation today in that same way. But there was a sense of potential. Anything could happen. You know, the freedom was possible at that moment that I felt that I, I want to recreate that sensibility as well as all of the the messiness of those interactions that were still conditioned by orientalism or racism or anti-blackness and and all of that because I think that that's the reality that's what happens when people travel and they organize but ideology and struggle can get people through those through those moments. Now Patricia Murphy Robinson and her racism capitalism connection, that's a whole, I think a whole other um, conversation. Uh, she really focused on the family as a site of oppression uh, for women in particular. She focused on look using Marx as a lens to understand the class dynamics in black America and the role of the black elite at a time where it was very clear that the people who were benef benefiting from civil rights were the black elite and where the barriers were coming down for those folks and then so what was their re responsibility going to be? Um, this is at a time where people like Amir Carl Cabral is talking about class suicide and you know she was part of this larger conversation an intellectual conversation. So I want to bring her as part of that. And I think we have to move yeah, we've on. Got, we've got three more. Uh, maybe we can hear those three so, and so then. Can we try and keep it a bit short? Because I think we're beginning to run out of time. Mm -hmm. We've got one. Oh, four, sorry. Yeah, maybe we can hear two and then we can hear two yeah. and then okay. I can answer. Yeah. Mark and then. Um, the anthropologists in the room who've been coming to RAG for a couple of years will know that. Chomsky and his relationship with what was happening at MIT back in the 60s and the student movement, the anti-Vietnam War student movement in the university was something. We've had meetings on that here and one of the things that wasn't mentioned and perhaps should have been um, is, is the fact that, that this very conservative university that was making all these horrible weapons for the Vietnam War and other technology, um, the radical students in, in one year, they, they were inviting Black Panthers to speak um, at that university somewhat controversially and also mm -hmm. donating the student huge amounts of considerable amounts of money 
to the to the Panthers when they when they sort of won uh, student union elections and that kind of thing. So there was there was a relationship between even the most conservative mm -hmm. white middle class sections of the student movement and um, the black movement. But obviously there was clearly tension, and there were different communities. Mm -hmm. and I just wondered <coughs> what are what 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 were the connections? Um, you can go into more detail. The other questions, just slightly like different issues. One of the problems that both the white student movement had and also the black nationalist, certainly the Black Panther, some of the, the male leaders had, was that, well, I think we mentioned the chauvinism, the misogyny, um, but the, some of the men, it, the leaders of that movement. And it's so, so, so striking when, when you think of not just Rosa Parks, but so many of the leaders and, and, and the backbone of, of the civil rights movement, even as early as the 50s, were women. And so what happened to the consciousness of the radical movement in the 60s mm. that that kind of chauvinism could continue or that did people just forget mm -hmm. women had been the backbone of the civil rights movement, which of course inspired both the later black nationalist movement and the student movement as well. Did they forget it or did they not know it or what's the relationship there? Doing two plus, is that okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. And let me just clarify, so you're asking yeah. me about the role of the conservative students as supporters or the role of radical students no, and radical, the, you know, okay. Mostly white anti-Vietnam okay. protesters mm -hmm. who are all reading Chomsky, that kind of thing. What's their relationship with Got the it. Panthers and the black activists? Mm -hmm. okay. um, yeah, great talk, actually, and as, as has already been said, it's, it's, it's such a rich history and so important and mm -hmm. so depth, as you know, that you can only compress so much into a snapshot as mm -hmm. you did. Very effective for all that, and I learned a lot. But my question is as the war in Vietnam uh, continued into the early 70s, um, and obviously the Panthers themselves were under the extreme duress and were schisms, and you know, helped along by contemporary and Africa in that guy. But so far as it was possible, did they, did they continue to, into the early 70s, did they continue to try and make the links with? anti-colonialism, anti-racism, black power, Vietnam. That's my question. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for those questions. Um, maybe I'll take the second question um, first. Panther activism in the 1970s went into different directions. Um, my work is on the Panthers in Oakland, California, and in Oakland, California, there was a real effort to shuttle um, Panther activism towards uh, community development and community, what was called con community control, right? Um, part of that had to do with a response to the impact of COINTELPRO and the FBI on disseminating the uh, destroying, I should say, um, some of the key areas of Panther support, some of the financial backing that they had, um, the mass jailing and arrests of, of leaders uh, within the organization. It was really a time of retrenchment. At the same time, there was also a continuity around how they felt some of the transformative impact would happen. So there was a focus on education, the idea of creating these uh, programs which had always been part of their arsenal, but centralizing the Panthers' work around um, these community programs. Um, with the idea of the goal is not to feed people's children before, you know, breakfast before they go to school, that's part of it. The idea is not to give people free shoes, that's part of it. But the idea is to have people question why um, a wealthy country cannot provide these things for the citizens. It's to be part of what in that time period, thinking about the relationships between the Panthers and the white left and a lot of the, and even the, uh, the counterculture and the people organizations like the diggers who focus on free everything for example as a way of challenging consumerism of, of really having people question the day-to-day -day encounters instead of thinking about capitalism rich writ large but to think about capitalism in their daily lives and so why you know how can we be politicized around um, paying for medical care if we understand that we can get free medical care um, what does it mean to sort of have both of those models and how can we use the models of these community programs to kind of um, re-educate people, right? So that was one of the streams that they went into. They also went into electoral politics. They had a long-standing coalition with people in the Peace and Freedom Party. In the 70s, they moved towards um, local 
elections, for school boards, for poverty programs, um, and also for, uh, for mayor, city council in Oakland as part of that. They moved towards community control of the police and putting those elements on local ballots and trying to garner community support for that. So th those were some of the ways in which um, they moved. They continue to um, sell the Red Book. They continue to talk revolution, but very much their relationship to how they saw um, capitalism, capitalism's demise had shifted. Right. Um, there was certainly a, a, a pragmatic sense that the revolution was going to be more protracted, perhaps, than had been initially understood. And they still maintained their international connections. So they remained very invested in um, the war in Vietnam, the war in Cambodia, the anti-apartheid movement um, as well. And at this period, they have an international section of their newspaper where they're talking about uh, global events. They're also interested in um, things like uh, incarceration, schools, education as well. The workplace? Pardon? The workplace at all? Mm -hmm. The workplace. Are they interested in the workplace? In what way can we say it? Organizing workers. They were not interested in organizing workers on that level. So for example, at this period we have the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in Detroit, um, who certainly are interested in organizing black workers at the point of production on the shop floors. That was not what the Panthers were doing. In fact, in this period we can say that the inroads, the way to become a member had been um, increasingly narrowed so that there was not a large influx flux of new members, right? So they were not interested in a uh, groundswell of new members. I think for them it was about um, sort of retrenchment, right? After a devastating period of political um, repression. So that was, that was sort of the direction that they moved in. Now the second question, I hope that fleshes that out a little yeah. bit, yeah. The second question about chauvinism, how did it exist? I asked myself that, you know. <laughs> I mean, really, it seems, however, the reality is, is that, you know, chauvinism was something that was not fossilized, that kind of was carried from generation to generation. It was something actively invested in, grown, watered, you know, fed daily. And so the relationships that people had in churches, the relationships that people had um, in their social lives, um, all of those things reinforced a certain narrative about male dominance, especially in the African American community, where one would think that, you know, part of that radical transformation would include um, egalitarian gender relations, but in the narrative that slavery killed the black family, in the narrative that black men were uniquely um, disadvantaged and harmed um, in the course of oppression, it was actually black women's duty to stand back, right? So a lot of that transformative thinking was something that grew out of struggle. Right, whereas many women stood up to say that we can be leaders, we are leaders, we are exercising power, we have exercised power, right? Um, so when I look at, it's not just Rosa Parks, but I look at, at how, for example, um, even in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Martin Luther King's organization, sexism was very real. Rosa Parks, you know, we don't have any, you know, wonderful quotations from Rosa Parks, right? We can't tell you what she said. We, you know, we can't, we don't have a vision of what her speeches were like. Um, did she give speeches? Was she allowed to give speeches? Would she have given speeches if she was allowed to give speeches? I mean, if you think about all of the things that held women back and how strong that narrative was that said that the things that happen to um, black men are the worst things that can happen to someone under a racist society. And we're there today, right, with now there's a movement in addition to Black Lives Matter, there has to be say, say her name, there has to be a reminder that black women experience police violence differently, right, um, that lynchings were not the worst thing that, that happened in black history, that women were also victimized by this long legacy of sexual violence and other types of oppressions, and it's not about sort of winning an oppression Olympics, it's just about undermining the ways that um, these daily understandings help 
sexism and misogyny grow. They allow the men to step in front of the women, right? Because they believe that they have something that's even more important to say. Quick note on the radical students, or should I move on? Can, can, we, can we leave that one? Because we've got one more question. Okay, no problem. <laughs> and then you may not be able to answer it completely. We are running out of time. I was, um, I was just pointing to and, and um, some of the radicals that you talked about, how they went to Cuba to look at examples of revolution to take kind of you know, instruction from that. But Cuba was one of the last Caribbean countries to end slavery. And even up until 1872, there was still a kind of secret slave kind of trading going on um, with Europeans coming from some of the smaller islands in the Bahamas. And I just found it interesting. This was around, what, the 1950s, the early 1960s. Mm -hmm. And so many Cubans were trying to get out of Cuba at that time. It just seemed bit paradoxical that Americans would be going down there to look at examples of revolution. Mm -hmm. um, in the 1960s, as more of the British Caribbean countries were um, uh, gaining their independence, they were okay. very much warned off from adopting any of the Cuban um, um, government um, social examples to mm -hmm. adopt in these new independences that the Caribbean countries are having. So it's quite interesting um, mm -hmm. that point that um, blacks would be going down to Cuba and, and just you know the brutality of the slave trade mm -hmm. and the inequalities in the races in Cuba as a result of it mm -hmm. um, that people thought that there was something to mm -hmm. to learn from that. I guess mm -hmm. I guess it was just the revolution part how. Right. I think it was the, definitely the revolution part. I think that over time, um, Cuba, like for example, a lot of Cuba becomes the first stop for a lot of African American exiles who are fleeing the law and fleeing um, repression in the United States. Many people who can then move on, right? It's only you know, a few people who, who remained in Cuba. And many talked about, again, the restrictions, the racism, um, the reality of those inequalities. Now, over time, places like Guyana, like for example, a lot of my um, actors who were involved in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee talk about going to Guyana, becoming part of the Pan-Africanist movement um, there. They talk about going to places like Tanzania, um, and becoming part of the socialist experiment there um, and feeling connected to places like Guinea-Bissau um, as well. So I think the Cuban um, moment, I think, spoke to the wake of the Red Scare, the proximity of Cuba to the U.S. geographically, the propaganda by the Castro regime around freedom, democ you know, um, all of that, and the hunger, the deep hunger for people to see an example, an example that included people of color, um, of what this socialist experiment could look like, right? So um, I think all of that kind of explains. I think the tricontinental was also a moment where people looked to Cuba again to sort of um, think about the difference between the tricontinental moment and Mau Mau, I'm um, not Mau Mau, um, Bandung, um, as kind of an alternative vision of revolution, um, non-state actors, and the potential of this unified movement and transformation. I mean, I know there's been a, probably a lot of Global 68 um, events locally, I, I would guess, and I, definitely in Paris and places like that, which have also brought out that student movement um, and the uprisings in the universities and all of what that meant, right? So you think about all of these things unfolding in a global sense, you know, people felt like they had allies. When That's what I'm trying to say, that when African Americans spoke out against the Vietnam War, they weren't just thinking about the, you know, the white radical next door. They were trying to connect to Puerto Ricans, and they were interested in, in what was going on in African universities, and they were reaching out to lots of different um, allies for, um, to sort of build, to build this movement.